thanks very much for um, the invite, or rather for accepting my self-invite. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about um, um, discussed avoidance and specifically the lack thereof in humans and how we can overcome that using pharmacological means. Uh, if you have made the unfortunate decision to uh, eat something during the break, fair warning, I'm going to show some rather off-putting images of bodily effluvia. Uh, there'll be a warning before them, so look away if you see this. All right, so let's talk about disgust. Um, in humans, we think this is an adaptive response to things that could potentially make you ill. Um, so it's kind of a universal thing that we, we all seem to have to, to a certain extent. And it tr is triggered by things like uh, bodily effluvia, uh, but also things like bodily harm, uh, maybe some secondary type of uh, discuss, um, elicitors. And some people even claim that it is also um, inspired by um, certain individuals. Um, it's also a very important thing in uh, psycho psychological well-being. Specifically, it's like at the core of certain psychopathologies, um, including like cleaning based OCD, uh, phobias, for example, for, uh, for spiders, and, and some cases of PTSD were the initial event, particularly gory. Um, and of course, there's people who deal with disgusting things in their jobs. Um, now, the sad thing is that for all of these, um, traditional means by which we tackle these types of psychopathologies don't really work. Like extinction therapy doesn't really work in disgust. Cognitive restructuring doesn't really work in disgust. Um, and, and that's kind of where um, we're, we're left with right now and where the following research is relevant. So I'm um, just going to explain my line of work a wee bit because it's a bit different. Uh, the approach is a bit different from the rest of the field. Um, and it is basically uh, using eye trackers in humans. And this is not one of my uh, similar materials. This is Tom Armstrong, uh, I'm a partner in crime for a lot of this discussed research. And the idea is we use eye trackers to just look at where humans um, gaze at on the screen uh, whilst we're showing them pairs of stimuli. Uh, so this pairs a day and cell neutral stimuli like presented here. And we also have disgusting stimuli like presented here. Um, these are not the real simile, you can't show you those for IOPS license purposes, but these are like content-wise related to the actual real simile. And typical trials look a bit like this. Uh, so each dot here represents an individual and uh, they look across the, um, the preferential looking display. And what you can very clearly see is that people tend to avoid the disgusting stimulus and uh, preferring the neutral stimulus. So if you look at how that evolves over, over time and over trials, essentially what you see on the x-axis here is all the trials and the y-axis is the, the, you know, the gaze proportion that people look at the different stimuli uh, is that essentially people look at the neutral stimulus in green a lot more than the disgust stimulus. And weirdly this kind of just stays. It, it doesn't really reduce at all. Uh, so these are 24 trials of the exact same pictures when you flip left, right, and people just keep avoiding the disgusting stimulus. There's a few questions you might have at this point, and I've grown used to very defensive talking because I, I, I do a lot of vision researchers. Uh, so let's go through those. Um, one of the potential alternative explanations is that maybe the stimuli aren't mentioned with visual salience, but if anything, disgusting stimuli seems to be slightly, seem to be slightly more sim uh, salient than others. Uh, you could ask, you know, measurement to measurement, is this case uh, thing reliable? Um, on the left, we have self-reported disgust ratings. On the right, we have dwell times for two different uh, items of both on, uh, sorry, two different items in, in different blocks. Uh, and basically the interclass correlations are the same, so they're equally reliable. There's a decent correlation between the two as well, which speaks to their validity. And then finally, is this, you know, ocular motor avoidance unique to disgust? And yes, it is. In this case, I'm just showing you one example of a fear listing stimulus. We have a bunch of other types of stimuli as well in a separate publication. Um, so very clearly, disgust avoidance is, um, you know, elicited uh, by these, these images. And we can measure it using eye tracking. And now we want to do something about it. Can we actually, um, now that we have an experimental model of disgust avoidance, tackle it? So the next thing we're doing is taking our eye trackers, therefore knowing where people look, and then giving them money whilst they're looking at the group. Um, stupid uh, experiment, but did it nonetheless. Um, in the pretreatment condition, we replicated uh, the effects. Uh, so people look at the neutral stimulus more than disgusting stimulus. And this is what happens when you pay people to look at poop. Um, in the actual experiment, every like four to eight seconds, you hear ka-ching and people get about 25 cents extra. So we actually pay them as well. And people just completely look at that disgusting stimulus. Money basically trumps everything. And if you just look at the um, reduction over trials, you see essentially this. Um, now, the crucial question is, does this retain? Does it you know, linger after we stop paying people to look at the poop? And the sad answer to that is no. 
it does not. Um, so we were a bit stumped at this point and um, basically thinking of what could potentially be the reason for that. And the reason for that is the reason that I'm speaking to you all here, uh, and it is in the gut. Uh, so this is a slightly different study by Shanava Mendez, uh, where essentially they're showing two different types of dyspasimile, um, things that should be on the inside, on the outside of human bodies, and also bodily effluvia like we use as well. Um, so in self-report discussed, there is you now a clear difference between controls and those that are discussed similarly, same in the facial response to them in a specific um, muscle. But what we also see is a gut response specific to these bodily effluvia that's different from the other types of discussed. And uh, with that in mind, and with the encyclopedic knowledge of my uh, dear friend and colleague, Camilla Nord, uh, we set out to actually test whether that kind of um, discussed avoidance um, gut link was, was a real thing. Uh, so Camilla happened to know of this, this drug, Domperidone, which is really special in the sense that is a, a dopaminergic antagonist, but it works peripherally, has barely any blood brain uh, barrier uh, crossover. So we set up uh, this specific design, randomized double blind control, um, and essentially what we do is take a baseline measurement, uh, give Domperidone, wait until it peaks, uh, and then do the same type of um, uh, task as I showed you before, 24 trials of just uh, free viewing, and then do it again, the same type of task that we did before, which is incentivized exposure with money. Um, interestingly, uh, pre and post exposure, we don't really see difference. So the solid line here is Domperidone, dotted line is uh, placebo, and the same pattern of uh, discussed avoidance uh, happens before and after administration. So now the crucial question is, if we pair that administration with extensified exposure, what happens? And uh, this is roughly what happens. It's you know, a subtle effect. People look a wee bit more at the discussed stimulus than overall. And if you capture this in, in the statistics, we see that on Domperidone, again, the solid line, but not on uh, the, the placebo and the, dotted, and the dash line, we do see a wee bit more uh, discussed approach. And if you just look at that across all the blocks, uh, despite this kind of unfortunate baseline offset, we find an even larger offset on top of that in the Domperidone condition compared to the placebo condition here in pink and blue, respectively. So in conclusion, uh, discuss normally inspires non habituating avoidance and just encouraging exposure alone does not fix it, which kind of calls back to those uh, original piece in the literature I talked about where cognitive restructuring and extinction don't really work. However, and this is where the uniquely visceral tie comes in, if we normalize gastric state using this drug on paradone um, that you know, normalizes gastric rhythms, uh, we essentially see a wee bit of a reduction in oculomotor avoidance, thereby act actively demonstrating this link between guts and, and brain. And with that, I'd like to thank my amazing Discuss collaborators, Camilla and Tom, and also my amazing PI, who lets me do all sorts of wacky stuff like this uh, next to my real job, and all of the people who at some point uh, paid my salary and or research, and also you guys for, uh, for listening and organizing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, we already have two questions um, in, in, in the tab. The first from Ing Lee. Um, the question is, fascinating work, Edwin. Just wondered, how did you interpret the discrepancy between avoiding disgust and fear, uh, uh, av avoiding disgust and fear-inducing images? <laughs> um, so um, essentially what we see in, in threat-inducing images is that people approach them a bit more. Um, that is, I guess, to maybe check out where the threat's coming from. Is it a credible threat? Uh, we use other types of off-putting imagery as well. Um, by the way, this is slightly different this time within a trial and then the four different trials and different lines. And we also do like high valence, other off-putting um, images like suicide related images. And there we see a more or less return to baseline over time. Um, so I guess in a threat, people might be uh, trying to figure out whether the threat is something credible or not. Uh, and that might inspire a, um, a slight approach to the, the stimulus in other negatively valence um, Similarly, we don't necessarily see that, like the suicide imagery here, and a positively valent stimuli, you actually see a sustained approach sometimes. Uh, so maybe pleasant images are the anti discussed. Great, great, thank you. Uh, the next question from Claudia Rodriguez Obstel Edwin, do you think uh, you would see similar effects if participants were offered other forms of compensation, such as course credits or, for example, food like chocolate. I wonder how involving food when looking at disgusting stimuli would work with visceral responses. 
That's a great question. Um, I would predict that if you offer food responses, people would be less likely to take them afterwards. Um, so there's some beautiful work by Paul Rosen and colleagues where they shape fudge um, realist, uh, in a realistic um, doctor or something. It, it, the the, the meta section is beautiful. Um, but the idea is that they basically ask people, would you eat this? It's really nice chocolate fudge. And people just say no because of the shape that it's in. Um, and, and tend to go for something that is non-disgusting. Disgusting humans, at least, has this uniquely kind of contaminating um, property where if there's any type of like food in even the, the idea of disgust around, then people stop, stop taking it altogether. Uh, whether it works in course credits, that's a good question. I don't know. That's, that's something to try with. Great, thank you. Uh, we have two further questions. Uh, one from uh, Giuseppina Porcello. Uh, she says, very nice presentation. Do you have any electrogastrography data in addition to the oculomotor response to see which gastric rhythm is specifically involved? Um, we were slapping ourselves in the faces after, after realizing that we really should have done that. Uh, we don't. And that's one of the things that is on like literally the top of the list for follow-up research. Um, so great question. We're on it. We're not quite there yet. Great. Okay. Next question from Chloe Stewart. Really cool research. Thank you for the talk. Have you considered looking at these findings in relationship to moral disgust or more social stimuli? I have considered that. Yes. That's also on the to-do list of things to do. Um, I will, so initially, I think that disgust in, in general is often a bit overinterpreted in the literature, like in the, um, in the sense that if you ask someone, which is the common way that people measure disgust, but literally using questionnaires and asking people, how disgusted are you by um, poop and how disgusted are you by tax avoidance, those two disgust things don't feel like they are the same construct. So I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to extrapolate the findings from this particular study where we use really clear, proper disgust solicitors to more social or moral disgust solicitors. Uh, but it is a very interesting question and it's also on the list of things that we really want to follow this particular research. That, that's great. Uh, one final question from Javier Oerzun. Uh, super interesting. Do you think that fear might be related with similar gutsy feelings? Sorry, similar gutsy feelings? Uh, gutsy, as in gut related oh. feelings. Um, so, what I didn't show you, and uh, that's actually in that Shenhava Mendes um, uh, study, they also had a, for the gore um, stimuli an effect specifically in heart rates. And I would imagine that similar work uh, exists in, in fear related stimuli. Um, I have not seen a gut involvement in that, but who knows, maybe, maybe there is. I should say that for the gore stimuli in that study, the, the, you know, things that should be on the inside and the outside, they didn't see a specific guttural response. And that seemed a really unique thing to these belief fluvia and therefore potential contaminants. Uh, so I think the gut signal might be more or less unique to the real core disgusting things and less so to other... Um, other discussed related uh, stimuli, but also other emotions like, like fear. That, that's great, thank you. Thank um, you. In the interest 